And welcome back to the fear of God. Uh, we are coming to you live from Santa Clarita, California. I say live. We're recording it live. You won't be listening to it live. And when I say we, I mean just me. Because unfortunately today, well, pledged is pledged. And Reed just just didn't make it today. I'm just kidding. You there, Reed? Ooh, no, no. The witch is coming to get you. So... We're taking a unique approach today, unique content. So, Reed, when you first pitched the concept of fear of God to me, even at that point in time, your your the scope of what you wanted to discuss content wise was a bit broader than purely just movies, Correct. You know, purely just feature film. And I don't know that we'll do those a ton, but it does allow for some fun freedom to you know. Um, expand our, our, our umbrella a little bit to cover different pieces of material. And today I had proposed to you several months ago, um, which you thought was a good idea. And I say, great. I feel like I have those a lot. <laughs> um, you know, to, to look at the work, this is kind of a mini profile. We did a, a more, much more expanded profile of John Carpenter, uh, in October. You could sort of call this a mini profile of a gentleman right now who is, Really seeing a lot of success in the comic world, Scott Snyder. Um, and so we're going to look at some of his material, but specifically we're going to hone in on his, uh, right now, just a six issue series called Witches, which is with a Y as opposed to the normal I. And uh, hey, how you doing, Reed? I'm doing Reed, great. Yeah. I'm doing great. Yeah. I'm very excited. This is another episode like last week where you and I are in the same room. We're trying to record a few of these while we that are. That was last and, week, wasn't it? That was. This is a really long stay for me in LA. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it very much. Sure. You're here all month. Um, but, uh, but no, like, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm very excited to, to dive into this. I really appreciated your passion for wanting to, you first introduced me to Scott Snyder's work. And, uh, I've immensely enjoyed everything that I've read by him. So when you came up with the idea for this, just to reiterate what you had said, we want to occasionally, uh, we know, I think most of our listeners come to us for our responses to movies, but we want to occasionally branch out and talk about literature or, uh, artists and other genres that would still very much be qualified as horror. Um, so I was very excited when you wanted specifically to talk about Scott Snyder and even more so, this six issue series called witches, which I think is really fantastic. Um, yeah. And just in brief, I mean, I, I've been a comic reader for a couple of decades, um, uh, 25 plus years or so. And, you know, uh, have, have been a lifelong Marvel reader, uh, rarely to almost never crossing the aisle over to the DC side of things. But, uh, five or six years ago at this point, DC began their, what became much maligned new 52 endeavor. And it was seen as this big jumping on point. You know, I, at the time grabbed a few titles. Grant Morrison was writing it was either action comics or Superman, some, some iteration of Superman that Grant Morrison with is a bit far out for my taste sometimes. And so after about three or four issues, I kind of let it go. But one that I stayed with or started with and stayed with throughout. And I think even DC editorially would say was the, the lone ace in the hole in terms of actually succeeding on the new 52 standpoint is Scott Snyder's Batman run. I don't remember enough to know, was I attracted to his writing per se? Did I know any of his material at that point in time? I just knew jumping on point. It was getting some decent buzz. I checked out Batman and since then have become just 
and an avowed fan of the guy's work. Um, had actually brief opportunity. I mean, he probably wouldn't remember this, but met him very briefly at Heroes Con in Charlotte about three years ago, cool. four years ago. Since then, I haven't absorbed everything he's written, um, or at least the back catalog. Once I started Batman, pretty much anything he was doing current, I read. But uh, to briefly touch on some of those, he did do a Batman run pre-New 52. This is very labyrinthine for non-continuity buffs called Black Mirror. And that's a collection you can find it. But I, I honestly haven't read it. I think I may have started it. And it was uh, Tim Drake, I believe, was under the cowl at the time. And Damian Wayne was Robin. So it was a very different take on Batman and Robin pre new 52. So read that. Um, he did write a small kind of graphic novel called severed, um, which is, you know, kind of does what it needs to do. It's very kind of in and out. I, I think honestly, what turned me on to him initially, and, and you'll see the brain train here was Stephen King's endorsement. Oh, yeah. Um, because Scott Snyder has another book that's been a long running series that I think is still ongoing called American vampire and mm-hmm. <clears throat> King, wrote i think one of the first one of the first issues he did so the first when american vampire launched and this was the only material by scott snyder that i had heard of prior to your recommendation um and i heard of it through stephen king's website what they did when they launched american vampire is there is in that first sequence of six issues Mm -hmm. it tells two stories concurrently kind of taking a godfather part two sort of approach where you're seeing the modern story playing out but then you're also simultaneously seeing previous history for the creation of one of these vampires stephen king wrote the previous history version so you have the backstory exactly so you have scott snyder's work in the first half of the comic issue and then you have stephen king's work and purely as a function of you know, I'm a rather rather a Stephen King completist. I like to get my hands on anything the guy writes. And so I read it purely as a function of that and then left it, mm. you know, and then it wasn't until your recommendation that I made the connection. That's like, oh, that's the guy who helped him write American Vampire. So sure. I was glad to revisit some of that. Well, and um, American Vampire is part of what kind of put him on the map, I'm sure, for D.C. when the time came to to, you know, hire him for Batman. Um, I. American Vampire, I, I, I have neither great nor great positive nor deep negative feelings about it. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I, I like it. It's fine. Um, not my favorite Snyder work, but I recognize its, its place in his career and definitely in his output. Kind of concurrent once Batman, New 52 Batman started, um, is when again, he really hit my radar. And since then, he's done The Wake, um, yeah. which yeah. is kind of, uh, kind of, or at least part of it is a take on the thing, really. You yeah. Know? No, um, I agree with that. Yeah. You know, this sort of, science lab monsters everything goes wrong has a very dramatic narrative shift in the middle um i love a lot about the wake um unfortunately in this sort of journey destination conversation that keeps coming up the destination ends up somewhat i struggle a little bit with the destination a bit but the journey is almost strong enough to make me kind of okay with it um it's very ambitious uh sort of conceptually which is can be both a positive and a negative you know i Sort of like, you know, we talked about Babadook last week and and one of the things I find so fruitful about that movie and what I find, what I look for in media is, is there something else being said than purely what's on the page? And at the very least, what I'll say of The Wake, I did like a lot about it. There is something he's aiming for. And Scott Snyder, in general, there's more going on than just purely what's happening on panel. So The Wake... I want to give you a chance to chat here, Reed. So, sure. But uh, so, so bringing us to Batman and witches before we get to witches. So, Batman. Um, I uh, I adore Scott Snyder's run on Batman. Um, I must confess again, as I just did a few minutes ago. Recognize what I did a few minutes ago. A lifelong Marvel reader. I don't have. I, I know all the Batman touch points. You know, Killing right. Joke, Dark Knight Returns, all those sorts of. Uh, for a uh, year one, um, right, right. you know, kind of those signature iconic moments. But to me, I, I don't know of, or at least I've never read, um, this long form solo writer having his way with the character. Right. Um, you know, and, and whether it's because it's that format, because it's Snyder, because it's Batman, because of all the above, man, it just works. Um, and, mm-hmm. and you've, you've just now, I mean, you're, you're, 
about five or six issues from the end of his whole run. Right, but, right. But you've just dived into it thoroughly. You read Court of Owls early on? I read Cur- Court of Owls uh, a while ago and then in preparation a fantastic for... fantastic Oh, it's entry. wonderful. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. Book. And I think uh, and in preparation for this episode, I wanted to catch up on the Batman run, which, as you said, I'm only five or six issues from the end. But um, I... So I don't know if this is true, and maybe listeners can kick back on some of this. I get the feeling that the rabid affection for Batman as a character extends not necessarily from some of the long-form continuity regular comics issues. I think it stems from some of these one-shot arcs that, you know, Alan Moore obviously has done tremendous things to rejuvenate the character and, uh, you know, Jeff Loeb with Long Halloween and um, Haunted Night and some of those which I've read and really enjoyed. So I get the feeling that most of the sort of rabid affection for Batman actually comes from him more as a pop culture figure than it does from people having picked up the issues and read it. So what was really refreshing to me is to dive into Scott Snyder's take on Batman and to read just a, a killer sequence of stories, mm-hmm. like hands down the best Riddler story that I've ever read or seen anywhere Zero is uh, Zero Year. Um, I, I think his because he really manages to make Riddler a sizable threat, right? And he capi- joke. <laughs> exactly, and he capitalizes on what makes Riddler a compelling character is his wit and his his intellect, mm-hmm. and makes it in a really believable way for that portion of the run makes you know why Batman is his match and his better and doesn't dive into Batman just being, you know, some sort of quasi paranormal sort of character. We've talked before to sort of uh, explain my statements a little bit. People make a big deal in conversation about the fact that uh, Batman is not a supernatural being. He doesn't have superpowers, but I feel frustrated at times because some of the stories basically treat him as if he does. Sure. Um, with their, you know, he's always the better of whatever the situation is. But one thing that I've always admired about him as a character is his detective skills. He is the ultimate detective. And I feel like films and uh, TV shows, and they don't really capitalize on that, on, mm-hmm. on that element a lot. Um, I think, honestly, prior to Batman versus Superman, because of as much criticism as I would hurl at Batman versus Superman, I feel like they do a decent job of presenting Batman as a detective, sure. of putting pieces together, solving puzzles. And but prior to that, I think the one that did it the best is honestly the campy, silly uh, Adam West, Burt Ward incarnation, where mm-hmm. he's figuring out the clues and one step ahead of the of right. the people. Getting back to Scott Snyder, hands down my favorite Riddler run because that whole sequence in the climactic moment of that arc um, is really phenomenal. And if you're a Riddler fan, uh, then you should seek out that graphic novel that, or that trade collection, I should call it, um, because it's excellent. But then also, I appreciated so much what he did with Joker. Death of the Family was something that I was ambivalent about because it's grisly, but then I feel like it it kind of, I kind of felt like it pulled the punch that it was going for towards the end. But then you had the, the Riddler or the Joker story called Endgame, which mm-hmm. I thought was immensely satisfying and a very provocative, compelling Batman story. And if you're looking for a good take no prisoners, pull no punches Joker story, I would definitely yeah. point you to Endgame because it is, it is excellent. So I'm just really appreciated Scott Snyder taking control of this character and being able to read a sequence of comics in the hands of somebody that I knew had a distinct vision for where he was going Mm -hmm. and being able to trust that and just really getting a lot of enjoyment out of it. I think his entire run is, is outstanding. Yeah. And, and he's just, he's a conscientious writer. Like there's very little fat, you know, on the stories, everything kind of ends up working together well in the bigger picture, Um, you know, ends his run with an art called super heavy, which is, uh, when, when it was being marketed at the time was quote unquote something that had never been done in Batman and, and more or less he followed through with it and made Jim Gordon Batman for a season, which, yeah. which is an actually really cool take, uh, on the mythos. And, and I read, uh, refreshed myself of, um, just in the last few days. But so, you know, uh, Batman was really the signature thing. Didn't want to say, Hey, fear of God listeners, go read 50 plus issues of Batman. It's, it's a little <laughs> unrelated, but where we're going today is a little book that started, uh, releasing, I think probably tail end of 14, 2014, 
called Witches. Um, it's a six issue run. And that's what we're going to be spending the bulk of our time talking about today. And Rita, as you mentioned, I just knew when this book started coming out, I picked it up because Snyder's name was on it at this point, sort of as Stephen King is to prose, Snyder is for me to, to comics. If he's doing something, I'm, I'm going to take an interest. I'm going to sure. check it out. Um, and so this was no different and started getting it. And one, the very first issue, when I knew I was scared of a comic, I was like, this is pretty good. They're, they're mm-hmm. doing something right here. And two, I thought Reed's going to love this. Oh. Um, and, and so I want, I want you to touch on that, you know, the introduction to it, but also knowing your wealth of, uh, history and perspective on the horror genre, specifically as it relates to movies, but, you know, switching medium here, media here, however you want to say that. Something that I think is fascinating about witches that horror is hard to do in comics. It is. I think. Mm-hmm. And I think a reason for that, and maybe I read this somewhere, maybe I made it up myself. Hopefully it's a combination of the two. Is pacing. You, you as a viewer of a movie are not in control of the pace. Right. So you are subject to what you are seeing as it's unfolding. Mm-hmm. Whereas in comics, it's a visual medium, but you control the pace at which you absorb it. And so timing and atmosphere and mood that are easier to do with audio faculties. Right. Um, with just, okay, this is a two hour movie and I'm, it's not like I'm generally speaking going to pause 10 minutes in and go do some laundry and then come back for 30 minutes and watch a little bit more, which is going to totally deflate the mood. Sure. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you are sort of, you're, you're turning yourself over to a, a, an experience. Right. Right. You know, whereas, Comics, it's a single, at least in, in serialized form, it's a single issue over months. You know, you read it in a complete form, but even still the experience of reading, uh, visual horror, you know, that still could be, could, could be too campy, you know, and, and the visuals not work for you. Uh, the story may not land. So, so talk to me a little bit about that. You know, what was a, your initial experience of just reading witches? How does what I'm saying resonate at all? Do you, do you find some validity to that statement in terms of the different media and how horror translates there? Absolutely. I do. And I think it's, it's, it's interesting because until you just brought that up, um, it's something that I hadn't really thought about talking about on the show, but that's a definite, uh, one of the re- big reasons why I wanted to introduce other mediums for the horror genre is because I feel like it is very easy to go to the movies and movies can apply a variety of manipulative techniques to sort of invoke fear in you, be it sound design, people talk about jump scares, things like that, that uh, can just sort of manipulate you on a visceral level. But when you read a book that is scary, uh, or you read a comic book, which has a combination of visuals and words, um, the weight is really on the writer to have a genuinely unnerving concept and a a much stronger hold and control of the beats within the narrative. So, like you said, I just think it's fascinating. I didn't even think about the fact that, yes, I'm controlling how fast I read it, how long I linger on an image. Right. Because yep. a lot of times it can be easy, particularly with comics, to register a single panel that is just an image with no text on it and pass it just pass it by. Right. Um, so how you read it and how you experience it, Snyder's really trusting you as the reader mm-hmm. to engage his material in the fashion in which he wrote it. Like an artist took probably at least 30 minutes, <laughs> you know, if they're a fast artist and probably a lot longer if they're not, uh, to craft this image mm-hmm. and to be able to linger on that for a moment. For uh, comic artists out there, I'm sure it probably took a lot longer than 30 minutes to craft a single image. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I funny. think there's a lot that goes into it. But, uh-huh. um, well, and interestingly too, to, to kind of willfully cut you off there and hopefully I can remember where I was going with this is, um, this is a very technical note, but several years ago, I, as a, again, lifelong comic reader switched over to reading primarily digital versions of things. And for those of you who have iPads, they have what's called the guided view in Comixology in the Marvel app. And I've read Witches, these six issues, three times now, maybe four. And at least two of those times was with the guided view and your note about how long you linger on a page. Something that turned me on and made me a fan of the digital reading experience of comics is that guided view. You can look at a panel, a single panel on the screen. So you almost, it, and it kind of encourages you to linger on the flow as opposed to, okay, well, I see this whole page. I'm going to read the text boxes and then I'm going to flip the page. And just pass it. You know, whereas if you're reading literally all that's in your field of vision is one panel. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I can study that for 
10 more seconds than I might have. Otherwise it, right. it helps you engage the material a little bit more. I, I totally cut no, you off there, but no, no, that's fine. Cause it, 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 it's a good point. Um, and I think that really, if you want to trust the artist and if you want to trust the writer, um, that you should, you should linger and, and you should take in the craft that they've taken. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, which is, is a great opportunity to do that. If you're a horror fan, the story itself, and this is connecting back to kind of the final note I was going to have on reading a story. There is a reason why Stephen King is who he is. Uh, there's a reason why he is so synonymous with the horror genre. There's a reason why um, he is so engaging as a personality. And there's a reason why, particularly you and I and his you know, millions of fans all over the world, uh, there's a reason why we keep coming back to him. Um, and that is just he understands story. He understands good storytelling mm-hmm. and he understands that you have to care about the characters. You have to care about what the characters are going through and you have to feel some weight of investment to the broader idea of what's happening. So when, when you look at a comic book or when you read a book, I think movies can get away with flimsy concepts. And if it's well executed in the craft of, you know, jump scares, or it can still be a scary experience, but it can be a flimsy concept with the written word and with uh, comic books with written and visual media. It's dependent upon the writer understanding story, understanding concept. And so that for that reason, and this is my final statement, I think that those stories have the potential to be and often are far more rich and far Hmm. more vibrant and linger with you a bit longer Um, I know we plan at some time in the near future to discuss the differences between Stephen King's The Shining and Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. And I find the book version of that immensely more terrifying in its concepts and in its execution, even though I think Stanley Kubrick's film is also a masterpiece. So Scott Snyder's Witches is, uh, is just resonated with me so much more than countless other films that I've seen and then just went through my eyes and right out of my brain. Do you think that part of that though, and I don't have a prepared answer for my own question here, but like, is what you're saying that because of the state of the uh, given medium, so like prose in King's case or just uh, sequential art and Snyder slash witches. And, and let's give some credit here. The, the, I um, imagine he would co- attribute co-creation to Jock, the artist. So, you know, this is not solo Scott Snyder here, but, um, is what you're saying, if I'm hearing you correctly, is movies, because there's such a more sensory experience, you can kind of cut corners and still get away with an overall positive scary quote i'm using air quotes for you listeners <laughs> experience whereas something like prose something like sequential art in this case you cut if you cut corners they're much more noticeable absolutely is that, is that sort of what you were driving at I, yeah that's absolutely what i was driving at yeah that i um, think you can't you can't cheap out when right. you're when you're writing this in at least and have it succeed Oh, oh, exactly. Right, right, exactly. Right. Because I think that there are plenty of films, uh, that even films that I would say I enjoyed to a degree that, that cheap out on concept and even cheap out a little bit on execution and they still sort of remain effective. Uh, obviously they don't get highly praised by me or highly talked about, but yeah, if you cheap out in the written word or in sequential art, it's going to be immediately much more noticeable. So the onus is on the creators to do, to bring their A game and to do it right. All right. And so, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Reed, so when I first started reading witches, in addition to the scare factor inherent with it, um, I thought about, about how much, uh, as my, my name for you all, Riri would love (laughs) witches. And so, you know, I want to just hear kind of, kind of, as I usually do, as I'm introduced to material that you've already absorbed, you know, what was your initial kind of, take um on on the experience of reading witches um well i was really thrilled by it the first time i read it it was one of the first things that i had read by scott snyder i hadn't read the batman run yet so i was just really impressed with it as a piece and as a scary story i appreciated it almost doubly so uh the second time that i read it through because i had a little bit of an understanding about what the story was Was the second time just in prep for this or yeah just impressed with it um i mean my feelings on the story as a whole i think Like some of the best work by Stephen King, it has a lot of thematic depth that could be mined. 
And I was impressed with the emotional component of the, of the story. That's a big thing for me is just if it engages me on an emotional level, then I'm going to find it much more memorable. I'm going to invest more in it. And I was really taken with some of the father daughter material. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know exactly. So, so we recognize that with films, uh, people have probably seen it or they've probably, they have access to it. Um, but with something like this, I'm not sure, and I'll kind of follow your lead on this. I don't know how much we want to get into spoilers. We can go full tilt if you want to, but I know that this I mean, sure. I think, you know, I feel like we should adopt an approach that if we are talking about a subject, we, we have the freedom to mine it. I think, okay. I think therein lies the value of the conversation. So okay. if you have Perfect. not read Witches, it's only six issues. Um, it's, they're easily, it's an easy read. Um, though a very compelling read, we are going to spoil the story of witches and as we talk. I would say just as a suggestion, you know, obviously, uh, there's Amazon, but also uh -huh. Comixology. Comixology. Um, I don't know what they run on there, but you know, if you're a digital reader like I am, that's an easy outlet for it. Though uh, I think the Amazon route, I mean, it's 10 bucks for the soft cover that's out. I'm presuming this is still in print. Um, but 10 bucks for six issues is an excellent deal. Um, as much as I like the digital experience, there is something tactile, something pleasant about the tactile experience of holding it in your hand too. And I would also suggest, um, if, if those of you are like, oh, I'm not going to spend any money on this. Uh, I am a big proponent of uh, your local library. Sure. Look up and see if your local library has anything, support your local library, please. But, um, look up and see if they've got it. It's well worth seeking out this material. And I just wanted to put it out there ways that they could seek out this material. Um, so getting into some specifics, the, the element that the daughter suffers from, uh, anxiety and panic attacks. Um, it's something that, uh, had a sort of an immediate resonance to me as I've become an adult and as I've become married and as I've become a father, um, I've become, uh, significantly more aware of the, legitimacy of anxiety and panic attacks in people that I love and care for. Um, when I was in my twenties, uh, I, with, with some degree of regret say that I didn't, I didn't really take it that seriously. Mm -hmm. I didn't really understand, uh, what that could do to you as an individual. So that's become much more prominent in my understanding now, um, just in conversations I've had and, uh, just with some of my family members, uh, just talked, a lot more substantially about that. And I'm a lot more sensitive to that. So the daughter has this, these anxious feelings, these panic attacks. And then it also counterplays off of her parents and their own personal anxieties for her and what they're also dealing with. Just, uh, the, the mother, uh, and wife has been in a car accident and, uh, that is, integral to the plot we sure. discover later. Um, so, but she's been in a car accident and, uh, and so they're just trying to navigate through dealing with life as it is and also making sure that their daughter is okay because, uh, there's a factor and this is where I'll bounce it back to you because this is one of the things that I find the most compelling about it is the daughter as a result of this, you know, anxiety and panic, she, basically sees or encounters these these witch creatures, things right. yeah these 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 creatures is a good word for them you know they called witches and that's the name of the book uh, but they're not your stereotypical you know broom and hat and all this other they're they're more uh sort of unhuman uh and so she encounters these things and uh when she encounters them they claim uh, a, a victim right in front of her um, and this victim has been tormenting her and has been bullying her and has been really making her life just uh, just a living nightmare. And these witch creatures claim her and the bully, the bully. Right. Yeah, they claim the bully. And when they claim the bully, uh, then speculation arises. Well, did did our main girl sailor, did she kill this person? Right, right. Did she? She's the only one there. There's no witnesses or anything. Exactly. Right. Right. And, uh, and so I just found it really compelling, this notion of something has happened to this girl and the, the father specifically, father and mother, but much more so the father is tasked with whether or not he believes her right. and whether or not he, or what to believe yeah, or what to believe. Story. Yeah. yeah. And, and how is he going to champion her? 
I'm not going to divert us to here because uh, for too long because it's maybe something that I want to deal with in a future episode more substantially. But my one of my very favorite books is Something Wicked This Way Comes, and I think I noted perhaps in our first episode, might have been earlier than that, or like uh, in a just an earlier episode, that uh, one of my favorite things about that book is two young teenage boys express to a parental figure that supernatural things are happening. And the parental figure believes them and goes to bat for them. Um, so in witches, how that dynamic plays out of what Sailor's seeing with the witches and how she responds to it and that she needs some help, I responded very strongly to Charlie, the dad, to his response sure. to that whole sure. to that whole thing. And that's where I'd well, and, you. Well, and I may have done us all a disservice, you and I and listeners, by not providing a quick synopsis at the top. Yes, as you've alluded to, so... The loose story here is this family of three um, has recently relocated to this cabin in the woods. You know, that's where all the terrible things happen. Um, and you learn throughout the sequence of the six issues a bit of backstory, the story you alluded to, the bully that um, harassed Sailor and is now, we know not mysteriously so, but to, to people who aren't Sailor has, mis- has mysteriously died. Um, this sort of mythology has grown around this young girl that did she actually kill this other child? Um, but so this family moves, they relocate to try to escape kind of the, that past. And the father is a children's book writer. Um, you know, all the best writers write about writers, right? <laughs> they How many do. times I just used the form of the word right in that <laughs> sentence? Um, so yeah, and it's just about their attempts to put this past behind them. Attempt and ultimately, spoiler alert, almost more or less inability to. So in terms of just, um, you know, the, the flow we usually operate on is uh, in terms of liking slash disliking and then some scary stuff and then some thematic stuff. You've started to brush up against some thematic stuff, but in terms of just liking it, yes. I, one thing that's really, that strikes me, and maybe this is because I'm a father of daughters or a father period, I'm going to use a reference that may seem out of left field, but uh, Friday Night Lights, the TV show. Yeah. Um, one thing I felt like that show always got right was it wasn't about teenagers uh, of whom par- uh, adult figures are just these bumbling tertiary characters. Everyone was well serviced yeah. as a character. Right. And I think Witches does that well. Unfortunately, I think the mom character gets the shortest shrift. Though even then, Snyder attempts to make her a fully formed right. part of the story as well. But it's not like it's a story of teenagers being beset by monstrous things and dumb adults in the story somewhere, too. Right, like, right. Th- there's very much a fully formed adult characters and Sailor the Teenager. So I really appreciate that about it. Um, like I said, even with Babadook, you know, something that I'm always drawn to is, is, is this about something else? You know, like what is happening on the page is monstrous characters that we learn are called witches. And, and Snyder even alludes throughout, drops reference to there's a deeper mythology to explore right. about these creatures. Right. His main focus is on this family. But I would encourage anyone who picks up this material almost as fruitful of reading as the actual story is, is Snyder's essays in the back of the books. Um, I'm often a fan and interested in the creative process. You know, what does this creator have to say about their work? And he says a lot and I really appreciate it. And it really reveals a lot about the, the impetus for the story itself, the origins of it. And there's also a really fun Disney, Disney world story in there about him being a, a character. <laughs> so I would highly encourage people to read that. Um, before I move into scary stuff, read, was there any other, you know, likes, dislikes, more, more surface level stuff that, that comes to mind for you? Well, I'll, t- I'll talk a little bit about the art. It was interesting because, uh, I go back and forth on how I feel about the art itself and I'll, and, and just sort of as a final note on the technical aspects of it, the art is very stylized mm. and, um, there are some pictures which, look intentionally like they've been dirtied, mm-hmm. like they've uh, there's some sort of mud or substance on the image itself. Um, not, and, and, and I want to be very specific for people who haven't seen this yet, you'll have your, your pencil drawing, mm-hmm. and then you'll have your colorization, but then on top of the colored image, another there level. appears to be yeah. another level of, of splotchiness that's mm-hmm. happened to it. And at times, I went back and forth about whether or not I liked that, because at times it obscured 
I wasn't quite sure what I was seeing. Right. Um, and I think that it's ultimately it's a, it's a stylistic choice that I admire, even though there are some panels that I would really love a crisper, more clear view of what these creatures are or of what this scene is. Um, but it's a consistent stylistic choice that I think um, gives witches a, a notch apart from most other horror graphic material that I've seen. Sure. Um, so, uh, so I went back and forth as to whether or not I like that, but I thought just in general, stylistically, it's very interesting. And yeah. I, I say that, um, ex- exactly how I mean it. Like it's, it's fascinating to look at. There may be some panels you don't particularly like as a result of that. And some panels you like even more as a result, but it's eminently interesting. Right. Well, and I think you're, you're hitting on, you know, calling back that conversation of just horror and sequential art you know, the, the, one of the obstacles, you know, like you, you don't have an audio track to like, if you've got a shadowy image on a screen, you can kind of have an audio track, some, some uh, sound effects that are happening in the room where the monster is and the people are hiding, you know, whatever to amplify the atmosphere. And I think, I wonder if in conversations and Jock, the artist is very stylized, but also as they were uh, developing the look and the style is that was that sort of an experiment to see can can you achieve similar levels of atmosphere and mood and creep factor by further obscuring the actual because to me i think there's a degree to which if it was if it was a very clean look it might not it might not achieve that mood and that right, atmosphere right. um you know so so anyway i do think that's an interesting interesting talking point there um so diving into su- to some uh scary elements I will take the lead here and then uh, we'll bat, you know, we'll kind of volley this back and forth some. So I, I think it starts with an amazing scene. I oh, love yes. the opening scene. I think, I think that little scene does so much mm-hmm. to earn a lot of goodwill in my, in where the story goes. Yeah, like, absolutely. You know, we are so not prepared mm-hmm. for what happens in that moment. And, yeah. and, you know, I, I, I gave a brief synopsis of the story. One of the elements that, that comes to the fore in terms of the, the overall narrative and mythology is, I, I referenced this even in the beginning, pledged is pledged. So how the rules of the witches work in the, ru- in the world of witches is if you are in, if, if there's something you desire, you can pledge someone to the witches and they, because they feed on people. Yeah. And, and yeah. love children, especially, but oh. feed on people. And for instance, there's a lead character or a, pri- a secondary, but you know, present character, this officer, um, who, spoiler alert, you initially think is just an innocent bystander to the story. Turns out he's, he's in league as, oh, as yeah. much of this kind of town is with the witches. And he says, you, you have no idea how old I am when he and the lead Charlie are having a confrontation yeah. and it's because he pledged long ago, some person to the witches and got a naturally long life and yeah. out of the deal. So the opening scene is this woman, this horrific imagery by Jock, this woman stuck in a tree and you see this knot in the tree, this hole that this eyeball is staring at you through at it's, it's one of the first images and she's screaming for help. Yeah. And she sees her son mm-hmm. right outside the tree. Oh yes. And she's like, help me. I think his name might be Tim or something. Help, help me. Yeah. Uh, Timothy. Timothy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and he's, he's sort of, you have no reason to suspect anything, uh, malevolent from the kid yet. And maybe she says someone pledged me. Or That's something. all she says. She oh, says, oh. please help me. Somebody pledged me. Yeah. And she says, pick up that rock and bust the tree. Mm-hmm. Well, he does pick up the rock. And instead of busting the tree, busts her upside the head. Yep. Mm-hmm. And the the final image of that scene is the little boy, and he just says, "Pledged is pledged." Yep. And that becomes this refrain of the story um, of the whole six issues that "Pledged is pledged." You're you're you've been marked. You yeah. Know? Mm-hmm. And 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 you learn a lot more about the mythology of that little boy uh, late in the series. But to me, that's that's frightening. That is a oh, haunting absolutely. sequence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, what what other sort of for you, Reed? Well, yeah, I definitely resonated with that image. And also, uh, the, the image, it's, it's a, it's a tense moment. It's probably, even though I wouldn't call it nightmarish, it is the most tense I am through the whole run of the book. It's a flashback sequence where the dad following, uh, the accident that, that literally crippled his wife and cost them their second child. Um, he has, uh, devolved into 
alcohol consumption. He's at the top of a Ferris wheel. And the daughter, Sailor, our main character, um, she is, although I say that, I'm not going to rather trail us there, but there's argument whether sure. Charlie or Sailor are yeah. the main character. But um, Sailor is climbing the Ferris wheel to get to him. And the higher she gets, and he's he's not assisting her, he's provoking right. her. And well, I don't... She, initially, she's not climbing it. He he tells he the story. Yeah. When I was in high school, this is what we do. It was a prank. We'd see how high we could get before he freaked out and starts calling her up the Ferris wheel. Uh, yes. Yes. Continue. That was the most tense I was for the whole book because she's right. climbing up there. And even like, I know it's a flashback, but I'm like, what is, what is about to right. happen here? Right. You know, like, because she gets higher and higher. Kudos to Snyder for the writing and to Jock for the artwork because they really build some tension there. He said at one point he throws his bottle that mm-hmm. he, that he was drinking from at her feet to try to kind of provoke her and, and spur her higher. Um, it's a very emotional scene. It's a, a, a very intense moment, both from the perspective of what these characters are going through and dealing with. And then also for the story itself, it's a, it's a, incredibly dramatic moment. And I think that was the most tense I was, even though I wouldn't necessarily qualify that moment as nightmarish. It's easily the most suspenseful in Well, in and the what's film. powerful, I was just, I was just cross-referencing before I said this, what's powerful about that scene, and, and Snyder does a lot of cross-cutting in this. You know, there's a lot of, this is the present action and, and the next panel is, is backstory. Something in back, yeah. A sequence of that. What's powerful about that specific scene is it's juxtaposed with a present scene of him starting to muster his nerve to, to be the father that the backstory oh, tells us he's yeah, not. Yeah. You know, like, I don't know what's going on, but something is going on. I don't know who to believe, but I'm going after my daughter. Yeah. You know, and, you juxt- and that's juxtaposed with this horrific, you know, as parents seeing that you're watching play out. So yeah, that's, that's great. Um, uh, I had two other little scary parts that came to me. One is just the knot on Sailor's neck that develops. That's, cool. oh, so that you creepy. find might be an eyeball. Oh, oh. No, and then you see, you see the diary page where she's talking about how it's talking to her or something. Uh, yeah. And there's this really creepy sequence where she's at swim practice and it's a sequence of panels and each panel, the bandage that's over, it gets a little more loose until it floats yeah. off in the water. It's oh. disgusting. Um, and then the other, uh, kind of the last one I wrote down, it's all scary. It's all very evocative um, and really does what it needs to. But And this works better if you're reading this as it's being published. It, it you're, You can easily skip to the next story in the collected version, but the end of, I think, issue four, right after the Ferris wheel backstory, he's, Charlie's pleading with Lucy, the mom, you know, we gotta go after her, we gotta go oh. after her. And the last shot is this full page panel of the mom who's in a wheelchair. You learn why throughout the story. And she just says, uh, but tell me one thing, who is Sailor? Mm-hmm. And you're like, what is happening? <laughs> you know, it's so, right. it's one of these jarring moments, but is, is terrifying. Um, any other any other scary thing, things? Um, you want to reference well, to? I definitely the the climactic moment uh, where you know the, the a large part of the plot is Sailor the daughter gets captured by these things. The dad has to go after her. Mm. He does that whole sequence is phenomenal. But then when he goes after her, gets her back in a very interesting enough because this came much earlier, but in, in a in a scene that will remind. Uh, our listeners and our and fans of this of Stranger Things in mm, terms of mm, like yeah, the upside yeah. down kind of mm. idea, um, but uh, in, in that way he gets her back. But then when they go back to the house, the whole climactic uh, confrontation at the house at the end was very effective for me, and is still is still probably my favorite part of of the whole story overall. Just what takes place in that house. Um, when they come back, when mysteries are finally solved as to what What's the source, on, yeah, right. what the source of all this was and what the stakes are for the future. That's a heartbreaking sequence. Oh, it's I, awful. when I was rereading it. So even since knowing we were doing this podcast, I've reread it twice. Mm-hmm. And the second time was on the plane heading here and, um, or the third time. Yeah. The second reread was on the plane heading here. And just watching that sequence play out between the mom and the dad oh, in man. the house, like it is so heartbreaking as a married man, as a parent. Yeah. Like uh, Snyder nails the, the, the human element. Absolutely. He does for something so fantastical going on 
literally around that house in that moment. Yeah. It's a very human moment that's yeah. happening inside. Absolutely. Um, well, I want us to divert, even though we've brushed up against some of it at this point, uh, some of the thematic stuff. Um, and I, I want to land on the sort of parental conversation, but, uh, before we get there, uh, address a couple other things. So, uh, the first one, one thing I wrote down and you can feel as free or not to answer this as you want, but it does lead into a thematic conversation is, oh so read, who would you pledge? Oh man. And what would you want? <laughs> oh, wow. I've got some answers. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you do. Um, no, uh, uh, so as I was rereading this and, and sort of devoting some mental bandwidth to just like, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on mm-hmm. in this story yeah. that kind of off the page. And, and I was thinking how, what an, what an interesting concept, you know, and to me, even jokingly saying to you, who would you pledge? And even jokingly posing to our listener, what, who, what image, what person in your life or, or personality that you're aware of that is conjured in that question? Like, right. who would you pledge? What pops into your head right there? Right. And, and what that does in terms of us as believers and what I wrote down was that it invites this question of responsibility and accountability, you know, because, because there's this interesting dynamic happening in the story. And I think that is, is, also represented in a more um, grounded way in the real world. And that's, there's a sense in which the characters in the story who pledge someone, they're not actually doing anything. Oh, they're not yeah. mm-hmm. murdering the person. They're not killing the person. Um, so there's, and, and I think you, there's probably a lot of examples we could run with on this in the real world, but that sense in which we, we want to distance ourselves from responsibility for an act However heinous, you know, I mean, right, uh, there's right. a broad spectrum you could approach there. And yet, I think there's something more healthy and, and wise about recognizing our culpability. Uh, here, here's a good example that may seem far-fetched, but things as simple as where are your, where's your food made? Where does mm. it come from? Mm-hmm. Where are your clothes made? Where do they come from? Right. You know, like these things that impact us on a very daily routine ritualistic kind of level sure sure that is so easy to ignore the impact beyond i would encourage anyone to become a fan and, and you know i'm a fan of john oliver's show and he he's done several segments uh one in particular last year on um child labor and clothes manufacturing mm. that mm-hmm. was like i was in tears by the end of it thinking i've got to figure out how to better better you know sort of honor what's going on in the world right, through my, right. through the smallest of actions. And that seems like a far stretch from who would you pledge to, well, where are your clothes made? But I don't know that it is, you know, mm-hmm. in terms of the question of culpability and responsibility, um, good stewardship right. of the world right. around us. I may not be enslaving a child in Indonesia or in, you know, the third world somewhere to right. make clothes, right. but I am contributing to the system by purchasing its product. That does. Right. You right. know, so I, I don't know. So, so who would you pledge read? I mean, inquiring minds want to, <laughs> there, are, there are no names going to be given for who I would, uh, who I would offer up to the witches and, and what I would want in return. Um, but I will say that like, it's, it's interesting what it made me think of your, the, the framework that you posed there harkens back a little bit to what we talked about with the fog and, uh, not my fault, but is my sure. responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's interesting because it is really easy for us to create distance, mental distance in our mind. Cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance, exactly. Yes. For us to basically uh, wash our hands, to use the pilot image, wash our hands of, I'm not, I'm not responsible for this. Right. Somebody else is. is but... That's ultimately what it comes down to is, okay, but it, does the responsibility lie on you uh, for doing nothing, mm-hmm. for doing nothing to stop this? Does the responsibility lie on you because you started the wheel going even though you didn't do anything? There's tons of gangster and mafioso and mob movies that come to mind with this where it's like, okay, well, I'm going to I'm gonna call forth. There's a film I, I definitely want us to talk about, so I'm not going to say too much about this, but I'll reference the film uh, from the late 80s called Pumpkinhead, um, where it's basically, yeah, I know it's a gruesome title, but, um, but basically the premise of that is in the throes of grief, um, a man who has lost his son uh, summons a monster to, to enact revenge. And 
part of what sets that movie apart for me from so many other horror films of its kind is um, I'll share this one scene and then we'll save other stuff for when we do talk about Pumpkinhead eventually. Um, after he has summoned this monster, he sees a vision of his son, who is dead, uh, in the car with him and looks at him and says, Daddy, what have you done? Hmm. And so the film begins to take on this turn of, well, now I've called forth something truly horrific right, right. out of this thing. You know, we talked about it last week with the Babadook. And, and with the Babadook, that was much more an idea of we are trying to manage our own internal grief, but this is something a little bit deeper where you're going to, you're going to summon something out mm -hmm. in, in retaliation. And it doesn't even have to be particularly in the context of witches. It doesn't even have to be because this person that you're pledging has done something to you. In, in the case of that final scene, which big spoiler is about to be said, we discover that it is actually the mom who has pledged Sailor. their daughter, mm -hmm. Sailor, to these witches. And the reason is because... Before you, yeah, I was going to say, before we dismiss the mother too out of hand, there is a pretty compelling motivator. Exactly. is because she is so distraught and fraught with everything she wants to she wants to forget right. and she wants to move past this right. and she sees the path of healing as if kind of almost in an almost eternal sunshine of spotless mind kind of way like the only way yeah. i'm going to be yeah. healed of these things is as if they never existed right. whatsoever rather than manage the grief rather than uh, move forward in the scar tissue. Um, we're still, we're going to pretend that the wound never happened. Right. And, um, and it's, it's a fascinating <clears throat> idea to look at the tragedy in your own life and how we try to cope and how we try to heal from that. It would, I have said to my wife, um, about certain situations, I wish this had never happened. Right. And in certain contexts, confession time, have stated, I wish I had never met this person. Sure. Because of what, you know, the, the, the dynamic brought into my world right, in that right. moment. Um, so I think so it's. So that's who you would pledge. Is that whoever you're referring to there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you keep pushing me for it. And, 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 uh, and so, so yes, I have names. Mm. They will not be sent on this podcast. <laughs> um, you know, a, a, another, uh, theme I want to, sort of bring to bear and there's, there's, there's two of them and, and they're kind of entwined. I want to try to hold off on the third until we fully embrace it. But something I wrote down was just sort of personal heroics and that's an odd phrase, but I think there's something so powerful in this story about the Charlie character. I mean, everyone gets their good, strong character beats more or less. Um, but in, in, in my own life over the last few years, and maybe this is, circumstantial, maybe this is maturation, maybe this is adulthood, this feeling of people who have, were once sort of heroes in your estimation, you know, whether it's certain actions or whatever, just you, this sense of heroes failing, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and, and by heroes, I mean specific people out in the world, not like Superman. Oh, you know, you died at Doomsday's hand, whatever, you know, like actual sort of people you looked up to really failing hard and, and, and feeling the personal, um, uh, significance of that. And, and, and something I feel I've grown to begin to comprehend. Um, last week I talked some about my own therapeutic journey and, and a lot of my, uh, wiser thoughts these days, I feel like are sourced there. And something that was said to me a number of years ago was five years from now, how will you have wanted to behave now? Mm. And, and that's really been kind of a guiding light for me the last few years, but taking all of that and trying to apply it to this story, there's this sense in which I think in real life, we, we pledge, we say, you know what? I don't want to deal with that. So right, right. someone else can. Right. And right. I'm going to using your illustration, wash my hands of it. I'm going to pledge this person to that problem. Right. Right. And, and we ignore it and we ignore it at our peril. Because the ignoring of it, sort of what you just illustrated with, I wish I'd never met this person or they'd never been mm -hmm. alive. Like, the more you try to wish it away, the, the more entangled you get. Correct. And so there's just been this interesting evolution in me of, and it sounds like I'm, or I'm trying to say I get this right. I don't, uh, I, I want to get it right more often than I don't though, is what does it look like to be your own hero? You know, what does it look like to, to stop looking everywhere else 
for someone to set the the standard for you right and just begin okay i'm going to embrace the difficult things and just lean into them and and i may fail and fall but it's going to be because i pursued them and i pressed in and when it felt constricted I still rose to the occasion or at least tried to rise to the occasion. And I think there's something really powerful happening in this story. Snyder does a brave storytelling maneuver in showing us Charlie on the yes. Ferris wheel. Yeah. That's bold. That's strong because as a parent, you immediately judge him. Absolutely. When yeah. you're seeing this story, but you can't feel the weight of his ownership in the present. If you don't see how screwed up he was in the past. Right. And I think there's just something really powerful. You mentioned it, the sequence of the descent down into right. the tree to retrieve her. Like as a dad, as a parent, as a man, as an adult, there's something very powerful in that sequence of he's, he's owning it. He is yep. saying there was a problem. I can't pledge anyone to do this for me. Mm -hmm. I can't abdicate my responsibility. Right. You know, uh, this, this whole story is about making others responsible for your problems and your desires, mm -hmm. you know, and, and if, and it's unfortunate, spoiler alert, I, I get the impression he doesn't survive the story. Oh no, he absolutely right, does right. not. Um, but, but what a heroic send off and not in this like typical superhero kind of fashion. It's right. just a man. And, and yes, it's a heightened world with these things, but you know, it's all about overcoming your own the obstacles you've placed in your path. Sure. Sure. You know? So I don't know if you have any thoughts of that. Uh, yeah, I just, as you were saying it and we, uh, you know, we referenced that he, not only does he not survive, but I find it significantly more powerful in light of your conversation, uh, what we're having here that in the end, uh, there is one character and only one character who pledges themselves. And he, hmm. Charlie wow. pledges himself in right. an act of defiance against what everybody else is saying. That is the sort of the climactic moment. He's got his, his wife begging him, let us move on quick, pledge, her, her. pledge her, let, let them have her. And then he says, it's going to be okay. And then in a moment that almost makes me a little emotional because of what he, he, he pulls out the pledge, the substance right. that causes it to happen, and he rubs it over his own face and then charges full tilt, you know, uh, uttering the battle cry sure. towards the witches. Right. And, uh, and also, uh, you know, in pledges the mom right. at the same time, right. you know, but I, I found it significantly powerful that he pledges himself and in a very, in every way imaginable, takes ultimate responsibility mm -hmm. for what's happening and in an effort to save his daughter, sure. which is beautiful and heartbreaking and profound. Right. And I think in what we're talking about, about um, this, this is, we've touched on this from time to time, but Nathan, this is, I'm not in front of a pulpit right now, but this is Christianity that, that someone would come and would pledge themselves sure, sure. on behalf of someone else to save someone right, else right, right. and, and lock themselves in. I will be, you know, uh, to have, if we're going to touch on the theological conversation, like uh, the scripture says, he became sin who right, knew no right, sin. Right. Uh, that doesn't just mean he, you know, committed it or whatever. That's like, that's using language that says like, he, he, he pledged himself. If right, we're going right, to connect right. it to this, that's like he, he became this thing. Sure who was not in any way responsible for it. Right. And that is the substance of what we believe at the heart right. of what we believe. And if we want to live a faithful Christian life, we're going to have to come to terms with that is part of the calling. Right. Is that in right. the moment when yes, you would love nothing more than to be the pilot and wash your hands. Right. There's one to other person. Take the, the gift of the witches. Yes. You know, and, and, and that's why I said, you know, it's, we, we, we dismiss the wife at our own peril, because I think she's kind of, you know, it's almost the prodigal and the one who stayed kind of thing. Like we want to wag our finger at the, at, I'm trying to set up an example here of it's easy to dismiss the one in favor of saying, well, no, the dad got it right. right. Like in her scenario, there is such emotional trauma wrapped up in, you know, she's lost the use of her legs in this terrible accident. She lost the unborn child that she was pregnant with in this terrible accident. Her child that is, you know, pre-adolescent is, or an adolescent is beset and 
totally under the thrall of these anxiety attacks and depressive swings, you know, to her, she sees this out and thinks, you know, this is it, you know, we can do this. And it's not, you could argue, well, she's being very selfish and, and there might be a case to be made there. But what I'm trying to say is we dismiss her at our own peril because we can as easily be her yeah, as we can be him and rise to the occasion. Absolutely. I think there's something very powerful about that. And I want to tie all this into, you know, we, we flirted with it, the whole conversation of, of this, you know, it's, it, I think it's interesting that this was purely unintentional, but <clears throat> the Baba Duke last week and now this, there's this m- very heavy hand of parental anxiety and, yeah. you know, strain and, and even trauma. And, and so I want to walk us into that conversation a little bit. And there's this beautiful moment, uh, where it's a flashback. Is it a flashback scene? Reg, the the brother? Is he the cousin? Uh, Reg is, uh, you friend. know, I think he's the brother of Charlie because they refer to him as Uncle Reg. So That's I right. think he's the brother. Um, he's at the house helping, uh, helping Charlie with something or reviewing one of his books or something. And, and Charlie says to him, and I wrote this down, he says, never have them, Reg. I swear you're never free. You love them too much. Like a vital organ walked out of your body and is out there in the world waving hi to everybody. And, and I think, you know, again, I encouraged listeners earlier to read Snyder's essays in the back. I mean, he, he talks about this extensively that one of the sources for this story was just his own sort of fatherly anxieties. Right. And, right. Um, re- brief aside reminds me of Take Shelter from another very, very oh, similar yes. themes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, wonderful movie, by the way, if you haven't seen it. But, you know, I think there's just something really fascinating and palpable about this sort of parental notion. And I think. I mentioned a second ago this bravery of, of Snyder as a writer to show us this image of Charlie on the Ferris wheel. And uh, I'm going to, I'm going to introduce this idea. It's sort of half formed, but want you to sort of jump on it as, as it inspires you or doesn't. I wrote down sailor climbing the Ferris wheel at the dad's request, at his request. Right, right. And what I wrote is the trouble with kids is they trust you. Mm. Mm. <laughs> There's so and, much to say there. And you have to be oh, a good my. steward of that trust. Your child will do what you ask them because they trust you. Sailor trusted Charlie to not harm her. And that's, it's, it's this powerful scene. Like you like Charlie. Yeah. You know, yeah. like up to this point, you're a fan. You're like, okay. You know, we're, sure. everybody's a broken character and we all have our flaws and we accept that. Right. But then you see this happen and you're like, ah, I don't know what to do with this because, because, because not just do you like Charlie, but you're a parent. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and there's this fascinating, you see this every day in these terrible news stories of parents and, and, and who uh, resort to abuse or worse. And like the degree to which these children unknowingly and unwittingly, and because they know no better and place their life in your hand, Right. Trust you to, they don't speak it that way. Right. Right. Because they can't quite comprehend it that way. Although sailors a little older than our children are. Um, but you know, to her, she's, she's confused, Mm -hmm. but it's her dad and, and I love you and I trust you. You're acting erratically. And by the end of it, it does break down. I mean, she's slinging F bombs at him and that sort of thing, but, but it's just this powerful image. And, and I think plays, you know, the Baba Duke is a perfect, you know, parallel sort of storytelling sure. touch point here. Like, you know, in, in that story, she is the caretaker. She is the one and only. Yeah. And mm-hmm. his life, you know, as, from something as simple as don't break the glass with your toy right. to mommy, I need to eat, you know, like yeah. is in your yeah. hands. And I think this story is about that. And which again, feeds into that personal heroics side mm-hmm. of things. Yeah. Like the fact that we see Charlie at his worst on the Ferris wheel. And then you, you, you juxtapose that with Charlie at his absolute best, his, his final best, right. You know, saying right. the trust you, you have inherently biologically, genetically, spiritually, emotionally placed in me. I'm going to honor that yes. by ensuring that to the best of my abilities, you're, you're safe from right. this right. scenario. I think that it's, I mean, there's so much that, that could be mined and, and, you know, we, we, we've, Gone on uh, a little longer than we normally do, but I think that it's the the, the conversation warrants it. Oh, there's a lot there. <laughs> there's yeah. so much there, and I think that that like this idea when you said that you know they they trust you and they inherently do, 
from the moment that they've come into the world, they are trusting beings. It is life and it is us that violates that. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that there is a juxtaposition as well to looking at the issue of whether or not we can trust ourselves with our children. That's something that I wrestle with a tremendous amount. I think about moments where I was harsher on my son and then in retrospect wish that I had been a little bit softer or sure. had shown a bit more grace. And we're just talking about like disciplining behavior. Right. It's, it's just, you know, you feel that pressure. I remember, uh, good Lord, I remember a moment where it was like lightning uh, had, had gone off inside my brain where um, I felt myself, Sawyer was acting up in the middle of a store, and I felt myself get so mad because there's about four or five people in the aisle. And they're, and they're watching him mm -hmm. and they're watching me. Right. And they're seeing how I'm going to engage in this moment. And in that moment, it became immediately more significant to me that these rank strangers approve of me as, sure, as an sure. individual and as a parental figure than it did that my son continue to trust his daddy. Right. And I said, I am not trying to be hoity toity here. I said this. I said, I whispered it under my breath and I said it loudly in my heart. I said, God forgive me. And I repent for every single moment that I chose the approval of a stranger over the trust of my son. Sure. Where my son might have needed me in that moment to be firm and to redirect the behavior, or he might have needed me to stop for a minute and listen to him mm -hmm. and look at him mm -hmm. and see what he was doing and, and recognize in that moment, uh, you have the opportunity at any given place. And yes, we're talking about it in the context of children, but you have the same opportunity in the other relationships that are important to you in your marriages or in your, uh, family circles in anything like that. You have the opportunity and the mandate to say something significant about uh, about whether or not you can be trusted, whether or not uh, you are a person who is going to protect this relationship. Sure. And that's something that we could divert into Take Shelter because I think that's th that has a lot to say about that theme specifically. But I just want to come back to this idea of parental anxiety that, yes, I know that there are moments in which, and I've, I've prayed it over my son many times where I've said, Lord, please protect him from my failings mm -hmm. to him. Mm -hmm. Uh, and please let him know amidst all of the times when, you know, daddy ignored me or daddy got upset with me or anything like that. Uh, let him hear more so that I am proud of him, that I love him, that I would give every inch of my life's blood to know that he was safe and whole and protected. Um, but, it is so easy to get caught up in all of the, the, the extra things, the side things, people's perspective on you as, as a parent. And people can get so judgy. They right. can get so condemning. Uh, and it just grieves my heart that we don't foster enough of this notion of, Hey, this, this person is in my life and they need to trust me. And I need to honor that trust by, showing them safe places right, and right. being safe with them and knowing that if they feel something, it doesn't, it doesn't call for me to just, um, you know, fly off the handle with them. If they're feeling mad, like we've tried to talk to our son about how, Hey, this, you know, it's okay to feel mad. It's not okay to then do this destructive thing sure, that sure. you did with it, but it is okay that you feel mad. Let's feel mad for a second when he cries, you know, like, I may be stepping on a toe here and I'm not trying to be judgmental myself, but as a man and as a father of a boy, I find, I find that girls are uh, a lot more, it's a lot more understandable for them to have a rich emotional life. Sure. sure. But boys are told, don't be a wimp. Don't right, be a sissy. Right, right. Suck it up. When they, cr when my son cries, when my son is sad about something, I, I want to be the one to come to him, pick him up in my arms right, and right. let him cry for a yep. minute and let him know like it's, it's okay and comfort him in that. And that's a whole side conversation, but I'm very passionate about this idea that we should be trustworthy. Sure. And however much you may say you are and feel you are or believe you are, you either are or you're not. 
And it's in your choices where that plays itself out. Sure. You either are trustworthy or you're not. And if you hear to, this. To temper that a little bit. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you can fail sometimes and that's true, okay. <laughs> true, true. Uh, that is true. Uh, let, let me, let me backpedal just, just slightly to say that, you know, we, we are always going to get it right. <laughs> we are going to make mistakes, but one of the beautiful things about a child, particularly a young child, is that when you make that mistake, acknowledgement of it and an I'm sorry goes a very long way. Mm -hmm. It goes a very long way. The problem we have is that we'll make a mistake and then we'll feel like if we apologize to our children for it, then we're somehow violating our authority as a parent. And that's not right. true. No, That's not true at all. In fact, you're enforcing the fact that it is okay to make mistakes. Right. It is okay to make bad judgment calls and that you solidify that by taking responsibility for it, then you teach them right. how to be yep. responsible yep. people. And that's significant. It's interesting. Uh, and as we sort of run for home, mm -hmm. steal second, land a plane, you know, whatever <laughs> analogy you want to do for wrapping a thing up, um, a, a man mantra in our home, uh, sort of a daily affirmation, if you will, is be kind, be smart and be loving. And occasionally, I will not be those things. And that's how I will approach it when I'm talking to them. It's like, I'm sorry, I wasn't kind and smart and loving earlier, mm. you know, and it gives, you know, sort of what you're saying, you, you, you are leading by example, but you're also giving them an illustration of like, you're not right. always going to be at your best. Yeah. You know? right. Um, right. and it's funny. This is a, just a random side note. Um, we recently are, uh, I'm, I'm walking through the Harry Potter books with the oldest and the movies with both of them. And we just watched Order of the Phoenix, in which you see this flashback of James Potter tormenting Severus Snape. <laughs> and Lucy, my oldest, says, wow, he wasn't very kind and smart and loving, was he? You know, and it was this great, like, <laughs> no, he wasn't. That's Good for great. you for observing that and learning that and making those connections. You yeah, know? that's great. That's uh, great. But yes, the trouble with children <laughs> is they trust you. Um, well, Reed, do you have any other sort of final? Per yeah, thoughts? perhaps a final thought. I just want to sort of illustrate. Uh, it's, it's an often used scripture. Uh, uh, Proverbs 22, six, of course, train up a child in the way he should go. And even when he is old, he will not depart from it. That is often used, uh, as a mandate to make sure that they turn out to be good Christians. <laughs> and I think that it is so much richer mm. of an understanding. It's what we're talking about. To train up a child is not merely to make sure they behave well. It is exhibiting the the life of taking responsibility, exhibiting the life of flawed people for which grace exists, exhibiting a life that says be kind, be smart, be loving. Um, a, that is training them up, and that that is significant. Yes, we're Christians, Nathan and I. Uh, we believe that that the the substance of making sure you share your faith is is of the essence but it's so much more than that it is so much more in just being being the people that you want to be as you said the example earlier in 5 years how will you want to have seen yourself behave in these moments be that right. and be that in front of your children be that in front of other people's children be that in every possible place you can be yeah that's a, it's it's really a great thought read. Now I want to piggyback. It's funny. You were talking about the, uh, the scripture reference of train up a child and, and what that doesn't necessarily mean. Um, you know, we, we, we want so badly for that to mean that our ch child is going to know how to have a quiet time and, and, you know, give to Samaritan's purse and, you know, all these very specific, rigid forms of expression that faith might should take in 21st century America. But something that occurs to me is, you know, the, the, the piggyback or the, the tail end of that scripture, you said, so that in their, when they are old, even when they are old, they will not depart from it. I think even of, because, because I think what, <clears throat> what you would certainly not be conveying. And I think we would neither corporately convey is what that doesn't mean. And that means that your child will never, that, that there should be shame attached. If your child ever does, right. you know, sort of right. deviate or, 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 you know, follow a different path. And I think there's something powerful to consider too, that training up a child in the way that it should go so that they won't deviate it even later on is what that can mean too, is even for that prodigal child who was raised to be kind and smart and loving mm -hmm. can come to their senses. Absolutely. And can say, you know what? I know where there's something better for me mm -hmm. and, and safer for me and kinder for me and loving for me because I saw it and experienced it and had examples of it. Exactly. You know, and I, and, and I say that to sort of, uh, encourage listeners who might be parents and who might have 
children who are difficult, you know, and, and right, struggle right. with that, you know, that that doesn't mean you, you failed, you right. know, and that, right. you know, it's, it's that, it's that ceasing, it's that not ceasing, it's that striving to be that hero for yourself, you know, right. to, to, right. to set forth five years from now, how I wanted to behave now to, to be kind, smart and loving as an example to those around you to acknowledge and take responsibility, to not pledge away yeah. when you do right. fail and fall. Right. Um, to take responsibility for it so that that child, if they follow a similar path of failing and falling, can can recollect. Absolutely. Well, I know what this looks like to be restored. You yeah, know? absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. I think that's uh, where we'll end it. Um, so what I what I want to say, as we say on every episode, is the fear of God may be the beginning of wisdom, but it is definitely not the end of the conversation. I know that this conversation itself particularly has centered a lot around parenting. Um, but I also just want to emphasize that we should all take the notes to to be kind, be smart, be loving. And um, if you have any other specific thoughts about that, if you have some thoughts about, you know, this particular work, I know we're dealing with something that maybe not a lot of our listeners have been exposed to or have uh, read yet. So we would definitely encourage you to read that, locate it, check it out. And, um, and then, you know, you can reach out to us in a variety of ways on social media. You can obviously follow us on Twitter. And uh, Nathan, what's our Twitter handle? At the fear of God. You can also like us on Facebook and publish uh, little comments to our Facebook page there and follow up what we're going to be doing uh, and what we've been doing. You can also email us. Uh, fear of God podcast at gmail.com fear of God podcast at gmail.com uh, you can also follow me on Twitter um, and that's at Reed Lackey and Nathan where can they find you on Twitter at the Nathan Rouse so we would definitely love to hear from you we would love to know your thoughts on on this episode particularly and uh, just in general about what we're doing you can check out social media to find out what we're going to be doing next week and as always Nathan thanks so much for having this conversation with me man I appreciate it as well bye bye